was almost always true that wherever Martin Luther King crusaded nonviolently, was followed. But nonviolence by Negroes was only half King's theory of protest. The other half was the need for direct confrontation in crisis. Together, nonviolence and confrontation ceased to be mere philosophy and became technique. It rejected the old theory that the Negro's battle should be confined to the courtroom, and it curbed the danger that more impatient elements would incite the Negro masses to open racial warfare. The judgment of history is likely to be that King's active middle course was wise, and that Dr. King almost single-handedly brought about in a relative gains that otherwise might have taken generations. The opportunity came almost by accident, the accomplishment through trial and error. But the element that had never been missing in King's life was an awareness of the Negro's problem. Martin Luther King, Jr. was born January 15, 1929, in a comfortable two-story home in Atlanta's Negro section. The house was on Auburn Avenue in the heart of the district. Down the street was Ebenezer Baptist Church, where Martin Luther King, Sr. was pastor. The elder King had come to Atlanta from a tenant farm when he was 15. He had worked his way through high school and college, and was known as a man ready to insist on the rights and dignity of the Negro race. Even in the midst of the Depression, young Martin was to grow up in material comfort. But he was not very old before he learned that most of the world was beyond Auburn Avenue, and that most of it was white. His age was only 15 when, having skipped three primary and secondary grades, he entered Atlanta's Morehouse College, a Baptist institution for Negro men. He later said that Morehouse gave him the first real freedom of expression he had known. Martin Luther graduated from Morehouse in June 1948 and entered Crozer Theological Seminary, Chester, Pennsylvania. He had rejected earlier interest in medicine and the law. Only as a minister, he decided, could he be an effective leader. The young king was valedictorian of his class at Crozer and moved on to Boston University to work on his doctorate. But he would remember Boston for more personal than for scholastic reasons. Her name was Coretta Scott. She had grown up near Selma, Alabama, a little-known town that Martin Luther King would introduce to the world a decade later. She was studying at Boston's New England Conservatory of Music and was not fond of the idea of getting married before launching a musical career. But King was persuasive and Coretta agreed to forego a career of her own. On June 18, 1953, she became Mrs. Martin Luther King, Jr. Martin King's final year at Boston University brought three offers of college teaching jobs and calls to the Pope. He rejected the teaching jobs and took the pastorate his family most opposed. Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, Montgomery, Alabama. Dr. King, as he now was called, found the church to be something of an oddity, a Negro facility of an otherwise white main street. The street of Andrusy was born. Montgomery went routinely about the Southern way of life, but Southern life now threatened to be less routine than before. Mrs. Rosa Parks, the department store seamstress, boarded a city-lined bus on Cork Square Mrs. Parks found a seat, but as the bus continued on its route, more white passengers got on. The driver ordered her to stand up. She refused and was arrested. As a protest, Dr. King and other Negro leaders hastily organized a one-day boycott of city buses. Past attempts at such action in Montgomery had ended in factional bickering and indecision. But now there was the young Dr. King. Now, because of the Supreme Court school desegregation ruling, there was a general promise of change. The one-day boycott was successful, so successful that it was extended indefinitely. An inexperienced but determined Dr. King discussed the aims of the boycott in his first film interview. The three proposals are, briefly, number one, that more courteous treatment would come from the bus drivers. Number two, that the seating arrangement would be changed to a first-come, first-served basis, that Negro passengers would seat from the rear to the front of the bus and the white passengers from the front to the rear, with no reserved seats for any race. Number three, that Negro bus drivers would be employed, particularly on predominantly Negro lines. We, the Negro citizens, had it not to ride the buses in Montgomery until we receive some justice and until we get a hearing, even if it takes...
King's home was bombed. He was away, but his wife and first child narrowly escaped death. A few weeks later, Dr. King and some 90 other boycott leaders were arrested on charges of interfering with the normal conduct of free enterprise. Dr. King was tried first. He was convicted and appealed. Now the Negroes went to court. In June, at their request, the federal judge ruled that bus segregation in Montgomery was unconstitutional. The city appealed to the Supreme Court, and in November, White Montgomery lost. Official word of the decision reached the city 382 days after the boycott had begun. This morning, the long-awaited mandate from the United States Supreme Court concerning bus segregation is still clear. That station in public transportation is met associated about a month ago. The test against city buses is officially called off. And the Negro citizens of Montgomery are urged to return to the buses tomorrow on a non-segregated basis. At the age of 27, Lewis King Jr. had succeeded his first step toward national leadership. But fame already had brought unfamiliar pressures and increasing demands on his time. In a moment of doubt, as the boy told a friend he was worried, a man who hits his peak at he said, has a tough job ahead. People will be expecting me to pull rabbits out of convention in the summer of 1956. He had talked about the Negro and national politics. There are Republicans, uh, there are Negro Democrats, but I do think that more than ever before, the Negro will vote for the candidates and the party that will take a forthright, positive, vigorous stand on the question of right. Some of the Negro leaders on hand were familiar men, but the man people came to hear was the promising new leader from the South, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Give us the ballot, and we will fill our legislative halls with men of goodwill, and send to the sacred halls of Congress Men who will not sign a Southern Manifesto because of their devotion to the Manifesto of Justice. Give us the ballot, and we will place judges on the benches of the South who will do justly and love mercy. And we will place at the head of the Southern states governors who, will, who have felt not only the tang of the human, but the glow of the divine. Give us the ballot. And we will quietly and non-violently, without a record of bitterness, implement the Supreme Court's decision of May 17, 1954. It was a speech and a print that moved the Negro editor to write. At this point, the Negro people will follow him anywhere. Yet suddenly, Dr. King didn't know exactly where he was going and he had trouble. There were rumors of a rift between the new leader and Roy Wilkins president of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Wilkins favored the traditional NAACP policy of confining the civil rights battle to the courtroom. But King had given Negroes new hope with the promise of direct action. Direct action meant boycott, picketing, demonstrations. The question early in 1957 was where to demonstrate next and how. Dr. King would not find the answers for some time. He would spend most of 1957, 58, and 59 in his Montgomery pulpit. The civil rights picture of those years was one of violence, of segregationists lashing out in resentment at the school desegregation decision. The names in the news were names like Little Rock and Clinton, Tennessee. Somewhere outside the picture was Dr. King, speaking, traveling, but seldom making news as a leader. On September 3, 1958, he was arrested in Montgomery on a charge of loitering. When he refused to pay the fine, a city official paid it rather than allow King the publicity of going to jail. A few weeks later, a second attempt was made on King's life. He was stabbed in New York while autographing copies of his first book. The assailant, a Negro woman, was adjudged insane and committed to an asylum. A team of surgeons needed three hours to remove the weapon. It had been so close to his aorta, they said, that a sneeze or a cough would have killed him. Dr. King left the hospital with plans to recuperate in Montgomery, then to fulfill a dream by going to India. At Delhi with his wife and a friend, King placed a wreath on the tomb of his hero, Gandhi. He was impressed by Prime Minister.
Prime Minister Nehru's determination to help India's untouchables through government action. And he returned to America to tell his people that the American government, by comparison, was not doing enough for its own untouchables, the Negroes. Dr. King remained with his Montgomery congregation for another six months before he broke the news of his decision to resign. He cited the demands of his new life, the travel, the speeches, the work as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which he had helped found during the successful bus boycott. On February 1st, 1960, a new term was added to the American language, the term sit-in. Negroes in Greensboro, North Carolina, descended on a segregated drive-in and demanded to be served. They said they would sit there until they were. The sit-in demonstrators were arrested, but the idea had caught on. Sit-ins swept across the South. From the sidelines, Dr. King evaluated the new movement. I think it signifies the dissatisfaction of uh, many Negroes, and particularly Negro students, with the slow pace of the desegregation struggle, uh, the slow pace of the litigation angle, and therefore this is a new level. Again, the emphasis is on confrontation over litigation. The only litigation not going slowly, it seemed, were the moves against Martin Luther King. In May 1960, he was arrested in Atlanta on charges of driving without a valid Georgia license. He was convicted and put on probation. Later the same month, he went back to Montgomery to face Alabama charges that he had cheated on state income tax returns. The accusation was so ill-founded that an all-white jury acquitted him. This uh, represents, to my mind, great hope, and it reveals that, as I have said on so many occasions, that there are hundreds and thousands of people, white people of goodwill in the South, and even though they may not agree with one's views on the question of integration, they are honest people and people who will follow a just and righteous path. He would not be arrested again until October 19th, during the 1960 presidential campaign between Vice President Richard Nixon and the young Democratic senator from Massachusetts, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Dr. King had been booked for taking part in a sit-in. Kennedy learned a few days later that King had been sent to a Georgia prison farm because, the judge said, he had violated his parole. Kennedy intervened. Dr. King was freed, and partly because of it, Nixon was defeated. The first year of the Democratic administration, 1961, was to bring new racial violence. The year of the sit-in ended, and the era of the Freedom Ride began. Segregation in transportation facilities had long been banned, but Freedom Riders went south to see if the order was being carried out. On May 14th, the first Freedom Riders bus was stopped and burned by segregationists near Anniston, Alabama. On May 20th, another group reached Montgomery only to be manhandled by white mobs. It took federal marshals and the National Guard to get them out safely. Dr. King became directly involved in the new movement. As chairman of the Freedom Rider Coordinating Committee, he conducted classes in nonviolent resistance. But Freedom Ride, like sit ins, passed on, and King was still a man largely separated from the mood and the movement he had created. Five years after his bus boycott victory, he still was in search of a new Montgomery. And the new Montgomery, he decided, would be Albany, Georgia.
protest wore on, there was no real crisis and no basis for federal intervention. It became increasingly clear that nothing was being accomplished. Reluctantly, in August 1962, Martin Luther King withdrew. Now, this mass pilgrimage, or these two mass pilgrimages, are temporarily suspended as good faith gestures and also as expressions of our sincerity in seeing meaningful negotiation take place. And uh, we hope that the city will see this and that they will use this time as an opportunity to make two lessons. Choose a target carefully and attack only after thorough preparation. The threat of racial trouble already had Birmingham in turmoil. Albert Baldwell was running for mayor as a moderate segregationist. The police commissioner, Eugene Bull Connor, a segregationist without fear, was Baldwell's opponent. If Baldwell in the form of city government won, Connor would be out of power altogether. Regardless of whatever the decision might be, whether I be the mayor or whether I be just a citizen, I'm going to do my very best to make the government of Framingham the best possible. Moderate asked King to postpone his demonstrations until after the election early in 1963. King agreed and used the delay for thorough preparation. On April 12, 1963, the demonstrations began. King and other demonstrations. President Kennedy released him. He was freed on bail April 20th. Well, we have four proposals or uh, demands. One, if they have branches, these would be included also. That would include desegregating the lunch counters, the sitting rooms, the restrooms, and what have you. Second, uh, upgrading or better employment opportunities for Negroes in all of these uh, stores. Third, that we are urging the merchants to recommend to the tuition. The fourth thing is the you know, the city populated bases, the integration of the library, and the other areas where segregation in Birmingham. After a marathon negotiation and an old one that refused to leave office, the old administration denounced the agreement. President Kennedy's response to Birmingham was not all vocal. He sent Congress the most far-reaching civil rights bill in American history. In August 1963, as Southerners in Congress delayed action on the new bill, civil rights groups organized a massive march on Washington. More than 250,000 people, 60,000 of them white, filled the mall all the way from the Lincoln Memorial to the Washington Monument. Again, the man they had come to hear was Dr. Martin Luther King. Little more than two weeks later, Southern racists would give their answer. On Sunday, September 15, 1963, during services, a bomb exploded in Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church. Four children were killed and several adults injured. People throughout the world were outraged, but in his eulogy for the victims, King called for understanding and calm. There are many more white people of goodwill right in this city. And we are able to see on the surface many of them are silent today because they are afraid. They are afraid of political, social, and economic reprisal. God grants that something will happen to them so that they will rise up with courage and say, this must never happen again in Birmingham or anywhere in the state of Alabama. But they are here. We must never forget that. So don't allow our struggle here in Birmingham to degenerate into a racial struggle. This isn't a conflict between black folk and white folk in the final analysis. It is a tension between justice and injustice. It is a struggle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. And if that is a victory in Birmingham, it will not be a victory merely for the black men and women, black boys.
has made it clear to me in private uh, conversations that I've had with him in the last few months that uh, he is committed to civil rights generally and to the civil rights bill in particular that is now before Congress. And uh, I'm sure that he plans to follow through at this point and take the same position that President Kennedy took. I think President Johnson uh, is challenged and will probably follow the policy of President Kennedy. The confidence was more than justified. On July 2nd, 1964, President Johnson signed the historic measure into law. The president handed a pen used in the signing to Martin Luther King, the man who had introduced the legislation in Birmingham. In the spring of 1964, before the bill became law, King had staged desegregation demonstrations in St. Augustine, Florida. He had personally tried to desegregate a lunchroom, and he had been arrested. A few days after this picture was taken, Dr. King was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. I do not consider this merely an honor to me personally, but a tribute to the discipline, wise restraint, and majestic courage of the millions of gallant Negroes and white persons of goodwill who have followed a nonviolent course in seeking to establish a reign of justice and the rule of love across this nation of ours. It, it is also gratifying to know that the nations of the world recognize the civil rights movement in this country as so significant a moral force as to merit such recognition. I'm sure that it will give me new courage and determination to carry on in this struggle to overcome the evils and injustices in this society. The presentation of this award also brings with it a demand for deepening one's commitment to nonviolence as a philosophy of life and reminds us that we have only begun to explore the powerful spiritual and the moral resources which are possible through this way of life. We are also challenged to face the international implications of nonviolence, for we know that there can be no justice in our society unless there is peace in the world. Dr. King's last big effort in the South was the Selma to Montgomery March, approved by the federal court after it had been forbidden by the then Alabama governor, George Wallace. The only way we can really achieve freedom is to somehow conquer the fear of death. But if a man has not discovered something that he will die for, he isn't fit to live. Deep down in our nonviolent creed is the conviction that there are some things so dear, some things so precious, some things so eternally true that they're worth dying for. And if a man happens to be 36 years old as I happen to be, and some great truth stands before the door of his life, some great opportunity to stand up for that which is right and that which is just, and he refuses to stand up because he wants to live a little longer, and he's afraid his home will get bombed, or he's afraid that he will lose his job, or he's afraid that he will get shot or beat down by state troopers. He may go on and live until he's 80, but he's just as dead as 36 as he would be at 80, and the cessation of breathing in his life is merely the belated announcement of an earlier death of the spirit. He died. man dies when he refuses to stand up for that which is right. A man dies when he refuses to stand up for justice. A man dies when he refuses to take a stand for that which is true. So we're going to stand up right here amid horses. We're going to stand up right here in Alabama amid the billy clubs. We're going to stand up right here in Alabama amid police dogs if they have them. We're going to stand up amid tear gas. Yeah. We're going to stand up amid anything that they can muster up, yeah. letting the world know yeah. that we are determined to be free.
America the meaning of nonviolent resistance, was shot and fatally wounded while standing on the balcony of the Memphis Hotel, where he was preparing to lead yet another civil rights march. The legacy of Martin Luther King is manifold. Perhaps he expressed it best when he talked of his dream on that hot August day in Washington before the Lincoln Memorial. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Let freedom ring from the surface of the 